request for me to speak said, we hope to bring guests who will share their own call story to the work promoting healthy minds, bodies, and spirits. In other words, describe my discernment of my own calling or vocation. That's easy. People are remarkably adept at speaking about themselves, and I'm no different. Uh, and my patients are no different, and people like to talk about themselves. But I will try, however, to share some insights with you and provide some tips to discern your own vocation journey. And of course, I'll try not to bore you. Well, how did I get to discern my vocation? First, it might be helpful to define what we mean. Okay, I get it. I know vocation is a term and concept that you've contemplated and discussed since you first stepped on this campus. It's a concept that you know better than students, faculty, and staff at any college or university. It is the central theme of an Augsburg ex education. In my normal style of teaching, I would stop right here and I would ask you, what is vocation? And then we'd engage in a dialogue about what does it mean? We'd spend five, ten minutes and achieve some sort of mutual understanding of what we're talking about. But for the purpose of, of chapel, I'll spare you that. As you know, vocation derives from the Latin vocatio, the name of this chapel series, or calling. It's expressed biblically in 1 Corinthians. Each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to them, just as God has called them. So vocation is therefore something more than an achievement, an occupation, a trade, job, or work. It is given to us by God. It is all-encompassing. It is not just church work carried out by priests and pastors. Rather, as Luther asserted, God calls us in many ways of stations of life, and God's abundance flows through us into the world through his gifts of vocation. Notice I said gifts. It be your work at work, work at home, your marriage, parenting, caregiving, perhaps for elders or others, public service. We all have vocations in the plural. And each of us serve different vocations, yet not just in the church, but maybe in business or law, teaching, healthcare professions, all different fields. Luther called our vocations masks of God used to fulfill his purposes here on earth. The famous saying, God milks cows for the vocations of milkmaids. Through vocation, we love, we serve, and love our neighbor. Frederick Buechner and his wishful thinking articulated vocation this way. I know we've heard this many times, but it's useful to hear it again. The place God calls you to is where your deep gladness in the world's deep Perhaps the, the greatest physician who ever lived, beyond Luke, or the poverty, or Jesus, the great healer, was William Osler. And you may not know about Osler, but let me tell you, you should, if you're interested in us, because he transformed us over 100 years ago. The remarkable individual who published over 1,500 articles, a great scientist, but also a great humanist. Many of his articles on humanism, ethics, professionalism, vocation. What he wrote in the context of medicine was, busy you will certainly be as the demand is great and happy lives shall be yours because busy and useful having been initiated into the great secret that happiness lies in the absorption in some vocation which satisfies the soul that we are here to add what we can to, not to get what we can from life. Luther's concept of vocation, one of his greatest contributions he ever made, ultimately is free. Like the Ten Commandments, the boundaries they provide are the result of freedom one experiences, knowing he or she is living with it, a God of life within the boundaries. Discerning your vocation is also free. What are some of the features? What do I perceive some of those features to be? Is it good and pleasing to God? Obviously, a vocation dedicated to crime or deception is not pleasing to God, therefore it cannot be a vocation. Is it 
consistent with their gifts and talents. Everyone in this room has that distinguished vocation consistent with that. Is it fulfilling? Is it fulfilling? You get that, that gladness. You don't really care how long you're doing it. The day whizzes by, you say, wow, what a day that was. And does it serve others in some way? I'm not talking about volunteerism necessarily. It could be making a new product that serves other people or teaching an effective way. Isn't it wonderful that Oxford College values you so much that it wants you to discern your calling more than anything else? How many institutions of higher education would make that claim? So my own story. Well, if you were to ask medical students, residents, practicing physicians, or anyone in healthcare nurses, others, if you ask them, why did you choose a career in healthcare, you will almost always get an answer something along the lines of, I wanted to help people. Well, let's dig a little deeper because you can help people in a lot of different ways. And when you dig deeper, you'll, you'll uncover that most of these individuals had a scientific inclination. They enjoyed science. They didn't see themselves in a career devoted specifically and completely to scientific endeavors. They wanted they were people persons. They wanted that scientific aspect. Indeed, people in medicine appreciate clinicalness in the care of patients and medical science, which are completely different things, you might add. And some excel at both. And Peter Ivory and other bodies come to mind as exemplars of that. William Mayo said, to realize that one has devoted himself to the most holy of all callings, which he thought was medicine, that without thought of reward, he has alleviated the sufferings of the sick and added to the length and usefulness of human life is a source of satisfaction and money can't buy. And if there was any way to sum up my calling, that would be it. And that's why I chose this career. It really began very early in my life. My mother likes to tell the story, and I know my son has heard it a thousand times, <laughs> that I carried a doctor's bag to my first day at age care. <laughs> And I was a uh, science nerd, if you want to say that. I, throughout elementary school, high school, I was that kid who loved to watch science fiction movies and TV shows, and, and I enjoyed everything that was about science. And when I was choosing colleges, I had just visited the school across the street with my father, and I walked out to the campus to meet Dr. And what an encounter that was. I was completely blown away that this man would take the time to spend an hour, an hour and a half with a kid from Iowa who wanted to be a, a science major. He walked me around campus, he introduced me to other professors, and here's the prompting of the Holy Spirit. I got in the car and brought this. When I came here, uh, I affirmed my gifts and talents. I enjoyed a you know, chemistry major, and I felt comfortable, and that's what I wanted to do. But my career thoughts about medicine were affirmed at the hospital across the street, where I was an orderly for all my years at Oxford. And I would pay my tuition, but I also got to see medicine and healthcare really at its basic level, bathing, clothing, I was the person who did that and still chose a career. <laughs> <laughs> and then went off to Baltimore. And let me tell you, a kid growing up in Winona and spending four years at Oxford did not prepare me for the shock of the East Baltimore Ghetto, where Johns Hopkins Hospital and Medical School are located and where I spent the next 11 years of my life. It was transforming for me in everything how I knew the world. Again, I discerned my gifts and talents. I learned that I didn't want to be a surgeon. And you, you all should be thankful. <laughs> <laughs> I was intrigued by figuring out problems, solving problems, being a diagnostician. To me, that was a great challenge. Not a technical surgery. But let me, let me say, state by I am so grateful to the people that do that. 
became drawn to public health, and I spent a year at the School of Public Health. And in that experience, I became drawn to biobiotics. I won't get into that in great detail, but that's my calling in the scholarships. I did specialize, though was heavily pressured to do so. So I was drawn to the diagnostic aspects of medicine, and that's why I'm showing this today. And there's some themes here that I want to share with you. What are your gifts and talents? What are the promptings of the Holy Spirit that you're receiving? What kind of advice are you getting along the way? There are many people along the way to do that. What kind of affirmations are you receiving? And my son looked at a brilliant suggestion the other day when I saw him last week and said, Yeah, I recognize that it changes. It's ever changing. And, and be flexible. After 11 years in Baltimore, I came back to Minnesota, and because of other locations, I'm a child. I have older parents that take care. I'm a husband and a father. I was drawn to the roots of my German and Danish ancestors who settled in Minnesota, and was fortunate enough to be offered a position in that time. While there, I discerned what I wanted to do in research, and I had a very rich and fulfilling career in bioethics, and I recently was asked to be chair of my division, which others have called a stretch activity. <laughs> Some have given me condolences, and I understand why that's the case, but I do enjoy that. So what does this all mean? Gifts and talents, promptings of the Holy Spirit, prayer, advisors, affirmations, and knowing that things in life circumstances ever change with many locations. That's what helps you what to do. Close from Jeremiah. Again, that, I owe that to my son Luke because that's his most favorite scripture. But God also said to Jeremiah, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you came to birth, I consecrated you. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. So coming back, God knows the plans He has for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in the future. It's not an achievement. So how do we discern it? What are your gifts? What drives you? What's your major? Why did you pick this? What did someone else pick it for you? What do you enjoy? This concept of flow. What is, what is it that you do in your lives that the time flies by and you say, wow, that was something else? Remember Frosty the Snowman? <laughs> Remember the elf that just wanted to be a dentist? <laughs> all the books, he was all excited, and he says, I didn't know what this is. This is really... He had his calm. He wasn't meant to be a dentist. There was a medical student I encountered in the past, and uh, he was rounding with us, and I asked him about a blood test foundation. And I didn't do the result. There was something about him that prompted me to believe that he really wasn't it. He really didn't want to be there. And he didn't know, which was really in that culture an unacceptable answer. Because the patient's life is on. So we sat down and I said, are you really meant to be a physician? Is this what you're calling? Is this what you want to do? And we had this interesting dialogue and ultimately he said no. Mm -hmm. So what are you drawn to? He said, well, I like health care. I like the concept of being involved in it. I'm really drawn to policy and the law and making changes at, in Washington. I, I'm not drawn to the bad side. So I said, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, the, the story ends is that he actually looked through. And it's hard to do that when you're on the steamroller of progress for some of you. You're in a medical school. You made a commitment like that to say, of course, I think we've all encountered individuals like that, whether you're a teacher or a pastor or you're an engineer or some other career that people are just not there. And one way is to look at what are your gifts, what drives you, what gives you flow. We're not talking about hobbies. There are lots of hobbies we enjoy, but it's not what we're necessarily called to do. And on the other hand, it's really sad where we encounter people we work with or we walk with. What about prompts of the Holy Spirit? I talked a little bit about that. 
in Luther's Catechism, the Holy Spirit makes me holy by bringing me faith to Christ so that I might have the blessings of redemption and the of life. This idea that the Holy Spirit directs and empowers the believer is this direction. When Corinthians were watched, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our Lord. So there's this action of the Holy Spirit in our lives and in being responsive to the prompts that the Holy Spirit works in us. Going back to Wigner again, you never know what may cause them. The sight of the Atlantic Ocean can do it, or a piece of music or a face you've never seen before. A pair of somebody's old shoes can do it. You can never be sure, but of this you can be sure. Whenever you find tears in your eyes, especially unexpected tears, it's well to pay attention to the closest attention. They're not only telling you something about the secret of who you are, but more often than not, God is speaking to you through them the mystery of where you have come from and summoning you, summoning you to where, if your soul is to be saved, you should go next. I wish I could write that. <laughs> <laughs> Just a word warning. There are also other problems in that life, temptations, and people problems. And how do you know? And I think this is where prayer is extraordinarily helpful. I'm not the praying type of person, but I talk to God a lot. And I don't say that I'm, I'm, I'm a good person, but I, I might say, say literally in the car while I'm like, what is this happening? Or can we fix this problem? Give me some help and guidance. That dialogue can be very powerful. But also, when you have those promptings, advice can be very helpful. From Proverbs, listen to the advice and accept discipline. And at the end, you will be confident among the wise. Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. Think of a person right now who you really admire, who you really respect. It's not necessarily a friend, but somebody that, yeah, that person. Well, I wish I could pick his brain a little bit on this issue. Or think of three people that have very positive influence in your life. Why were they influenced? Influential? Why do you respect them? Seek advice from these people. Make them, as my pastor would say, your personal board of directors. Affirmations are really important. It may, for students, it may be a faculty member who pulls you aside and says, Can we talk to you a bit about your career? Can you tell me how you thought that through over on your essay? That was really interesting. Have you thought about this as a possibility? Those affirmations are meaningful. And then recognize that vocation is ever changing. So that's some homework. Getting back to the original scripture, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you both in the future. Think about your gifts and talents. Be open to those promptings of the Holy Spirit. When you get them, pray about it. Talk about it. Seek advice from those people you respect. Again, not necessarily your friends, but people that you hold in high esteem. Pay attention to the affirmations you see, especially during those flow moments in your life. And recognize that you have multiple locations and that they're ever changing. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Please pray with me. Gracious God, those of nurture and illness, we thank you for those who strive to provide quality mental attention and wise counsel to all who are in need. We ask for your merciful presence amidst all of the illness pain, and suffering in our world. We lift up those who are in need for grieving loved ones, especially Tracy, Peggy, Florence, and those who remain silently in our love. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Holy One, you do not distance yourself from the pain of your people, but in Jesus you bear the pain with all who suffer at others' hands. With your cleansing love, bring healing and strength to the bright and cold community, and by your justice, lift them up that in my body, mind, and spirit they may again rejoice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay.
you so much, Paul, for preaching. Dr. Miller was one of our very first Boccaccio Chapel speakers when we received the, uh, what we used to call the Lily Grant, and you uh, share abundantly with Oxford. So thank you so much. And look at this duo here. Think of the impact they are making on this world in medicine and healthcare and the environment it is stunning. A reminder that tomorrow is a music day in chapel. Please invite your colleagues and your friends. And tonight uh, is traditionally Wednesday night communion. We are using a chunk of that time for interfaith prayer vigil for peace in response to the recent shootings at the Brian Coe Community Center. So please invite folks to that. And uh, please stand as you are able to receive the benediction. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in peace as you need to or stay and sing and a reminder that we have lunch with Dr. Mueller. Uh,